Pop and I've been working for the company for four years. This is my first time ever at the fish store and I am super excited. I'm gonna take you along today. We're gonna see what cool looking fish I can find that I normally don't see at home. Let's go. So the first fish I saw immediately when coming in the door is the spotted headstander. To me, they kind of look like the opposite of a pencil fish. So you know how pencil fish, that's a schooling fish that's kind of diagonal, 45 degrees, but they point upwards versus the headstander, like its common name, points downwards. Very beautiful fish, very active, not shy at all. You see, I came right up to the tank and they're not going anywhere, right? And we've got this kind of silvery body as the spotting black grid like kind of all over its body the solid black line on it, as well as the dorsal fin seems to have some spots on it as well. Really hardy, really easy to eat, and one of the really unusual behaviors is that when you feed them, they apparently do this clicking kind of noise. I would say that uh, in general, you do want to keep a larger school if possible, and the recommendation I talked to Brandon was maybe you don't keep them with slower fish or long fin fish, but you can see right here, we have them with high fin paleatus corridors and they're pretty much leaving them alone. So if you're interested in this kind of weird oddball fish that doesn't swim horizontal like everybody else, give them a shot. Obviously, I could not pass by this Congo puffer because he looks like a tiny flying potato spud. <laughs> He's absolutely adorable, it. And this is, I actually just wrote an article about my top 10 puffer fish. I can't believe I didn't put the Congo puffer on because they are absolutely adorable. Obviously right now, very, very tiny. Eventually he's gonna grow up to six inches. And then this kind of tan model pattern will eventually turn into a beautiful burnt orange color, which is what they're known for. Absolutely gorgeous. What makes us more of a fish for advanced fish keepers, or maybe somebody who has like a fish room with lots of tanks is you're gonna be expected to keep this fish by itself. It is pretty much a fish eater. So you're going to probably aim for a 30 to 40 gallon aquarium. And then they really do like live foods. So things like ghost shrimp, maybe some insects insects that you can buy at reptile stores, as well as you could breed your own guppies or dwarf shrimp, as well as go ahead and try bigger, meatier, frozen and freeze dried foods. So things like krill and mysis shrimp. Now, most puffer fish, you really want to be careful about their beak or their teeth as they grow and grow and grow, which is why you normally want to feed lots of crunchy foods. Thankfully, with the Congo puffer, they actually have like a softer beak, so they don't really need to eat a ton of crunchy foods. They can kind of manage that themselves. So I have actually kept Epistogramma before, but never this particular variety. This is the Epistogramma McMasteri Redneck. And in fact, I've heard the super redneck gold version is even more intense in its coloration with the golds and the reds. It is one of the best selling fish at Aquarium Co-op because of those intense colors. I really love Epistos. They're kind of a bottom dwelling-ish cichlid, comes from South America. You can keep them in low 80s degrees Fahrenheit, but what's really cool about them is their breeding behavior. You can see that we have several Episto caves in here because they are cave spawners and they actually show parental care. So the female will guard the eggs and the fry while the male kind of patrols around and guards the whole territory. Now, the McMasteri species gets a little bit bigger than some of the normal Episto species. So once they reach adulthood, I would recommend upgrading to a coconut hut just to give them a little more room. When you go to the fish store and you try to get one male and one female to pair up, just remember that there's like no 100% guarantee. Sometimes there's something called a sneaker male where some of the beta males will try to use female colors to hide a little bit. And then when you take them home, you realize you have two males. Also, even if you get one male and one female, they may not necessarily pair up and get along, so you can always try again. This is a fish I've never seen before. I have kept dwarf chain loaches, but this is the pygmy multi-stripe loach. So it's got that you know, typical loach uh, shape where it has the pointy nose, torpedo shaped body, kind of a lighter colored body with vertical striping on it. And they're way smaller too. I think the females max out at about 1.5 inches. And you can see they're very, very active. They stay kind of, I would say the, mid-water to bottom of the tank, and very, very hardy from what I've heard, even hardier than rosy loaches. Because of that pointier snout, I would suspect that they probably go after small, really, really tiny pest snails. However, Brandon, our store manager, actually keeps them with his narrate snails and Malaysian trumpet snails, and so far they've left them alone. Like a lot of loaches, they do like that cooler water, so you can keep them in an unheated aquarium, but I wouldn't say anything above 80 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So if you're looking for a really peaceful, really hardy kind of schooling fish that lives in the bottom half of the aquarium, definitely give these ones a try because I definitely haven't seen them around. Now I know this fish may be not as unfamiliar to many of you, but for me, since I mostly keep nano tanks, the dwarf petricola catfish is definitely one of my bucket fish lists. I love them. They're about 4.5 inches in length in adulthood, which means I'm gonna need a 40 gallon breeder or larger. I really like their unusual patterns and colors. So it's got this gray body with black spots all over it. And then the high contrast black and white fins are amazing looking. Plus they've got really long whiskers and they're very, very active as you can see. In fact, in adulthood, they're gonna be even more outgoing, I would say, than they are now as juveniles. While they do come from Lake Tanganyika, you don't need to add like cichlid salts in there to make sure the pH and GH are really high. I would say pH neutral is actually okay, but the GH being higher than normal is pretty important. The coolest thing I discovered about them is, yes, they are egg scatterers, but they also do this thing called brood par par parasitism. <laughs> parasitism. <laughs> <laughs> where apparently they know to lay their eggs at the same time as other Lake Tanganyika cichlids that are mouth brooders. So once all the catfish and cichlid eggs get mixed together, the cichlid mouth brooder comes in, gobbles them all, and then once the catfish fry hatch out, they eat all the eggs, and so the cichlid ends up holding a mouthful of catfish, which is really cool. This may be the last store tour video we do before the grand reveal of the store expansion. So if you need a sneak peek in the meanwhile, make sure to check out this video over here. Enjoy Nature Daily.